Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today I have with me Anthony Kent. He serves as the Associate Secretary for the Ministerial Association of the General Conference. Thank you for joining me today, Anthony. Did I get that whole association and title correct there? Okay, good. Because I think I had always kind of, I think I knew that the Ministerial Association was an association, but I think I often sometimes still consider you a department. What's the difference between a department and an association? Well, the Ministerial Association, it's a an association of peers. We're, we're not the boss. We don't direct pastors. We support and resource pastors. So it's a gathering of peers, pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses, those in ministry together. Okay. Well, that, that helps me. Now I, now I understand a little bit better and I will remember that it's an association. So the first time, I mean, I've, I've seen you for a while, but the, the time that you made the big impression on me, um, we go to the same church, and I remember you riding your bicycle into our church along with a number of other people. And I know that um, there was a special reasoning behind You're this making me blush. bike ride. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not often you get a bunch of like, you know, presidents of, you know, conferences or divisions and GC people riding their bikes in bike attire, not in their suits, into a church service. So it, it definitely was a very memorable event. But what was more memorable than that was the heartfelt reason that you shared with our church as to why all of these men and one woman had gathered to ride their bicycles. And I want to start there. A long time ago in a far off land, (laughs) tell me a little bit about your great, great grandfather. Okay. Well, it, it starts in the 1800s and it actually starts not so much with my great, great grandfather, but in Scotland. In 1846, a guy by the name of Philip Ainsley Reekie was born. Scotsman. What else would you expect in Scotland? <laughs> and grew up happily married with four children and tragedy struck. His wife died. He remarried. The second marriage was an absolute disaster. <laughs> so he was in a difficult situation. So with his four children, he emigrated from Scotland to Australia looking for a new life. And he arrived in the early 1800s in Melbourne, uh, early 1880s in Melbourne. And somebody gave him a book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. He read it, completely changed his life, transformed him in every way. Mm. He became a Seventh-day Adventist. He had a job, this guy, Philip Reeky, he had a job as a, an engraver, you know, on metal. He threw that in because he wanted to, I presume, engrave God's word, God's love on people's heart. And he got a bicycle and he rode this bike thousands of miles as a literature evangelist sharing Christian Adventist books. And he rode through cities, towns, villages in the middle of nowhere. In one particular day, he rode up in this middle of nowhere place, not even Australians have heard of this place, (laughs) called Ugaura. And seriously, it's remote. And there's a guy plowing behind his horse. And that was my great, great grandfather. But something had happened in our family, just prior to Philip Reeky arriving. My great-great-grandparents, their names were Tom and Mary, Kent. Tom and Mary, what else would it be? It sounds very good. <laughs> they had 11 kids. And That's a few kids. <laughs> it is, it is. Mary was 45, she caught pneumonia, and she knew she wasn't going to survive. Their youngest child, she was still nursing, the youngest one. And she said to Tom, they were nominal Christians at best. And she said to Tom, I'm not going to make it. But she said, promise me that 
when your time comes, you'll, you'll meet me in heaven and do all that you can so that the kids will join us. Tom didn't know how to keep that promise, but he made that promise. And Mary did die tragically. First thing he did was he went and bought a Bible and started reading it. And then that day he's plowing in the middle of nowhere and Philip Rieke rides up to him on a bicycle and sells him the great controversy. And he read it. He struggled with it. There was material in there that he really wrestled with. But finally he accepted it. He thought he was the only Sabbath observer in the whole country. His family, his kids, except for the very youngest one, thought he'd gone nuts. They thought he had religious mania. And anyway, he would go down to the river which bordered their farm with the, you know, and just take his Bible down and keep Sabbath there by the river. Hmm. And then one particular weekend he was in Sydney and he was in a park and he was keeping Sabbath in a park and in the distance he heard people singing and they were singing hymns and he followed his ears and found the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wow. So that's back in the 1880s, 1890s, and that was how my father's side of the family came into the church. That is an incredible legacy um, to, to be able to know that story is even more special, to have had that heritage passed on, which is one of the reasons why we even do this podcast, because knowing these stories of how God is moving in our lives isn't just for those of us who are here now. This is actually a gift to future generations so they can understand God's faithfulness, just as you were able to, obviously not through a recording, <laughs> but be yeah. able to have that story passed down. Now, you yeah. said that's how your father's side came. So can I did tell your you mother's? Just, yeah, yeah, I've never heard the mother's side of this. Well, uh, there's a little bit more that I should share about my father's, and then I want to come to my mother's. On my, my great-great-grandfather became really active. He prayed for all of his kids, and they all accepted the message, and they were all baptized. At least two of his sons became pastors. And then of his grandchildren, there were five pastors in one line. And then, you know, there's been others. I think there's been 11 pastor Kents. From, wow. from that. And he also shared with his neighbours. There were five other families that lived around him. And he shared the book and he gave Bible studies to them as well. There were the Gersbacks, the Thompsons, the Chapmans, the Grays, and um, the Packhams. They all became Adventists and their children. An extraordinary thing. And when, when you count up the generations, the descendants... And those that they've brought into and discipled into Jesus and become Adventists, the minimum estimate is 20,000 people from just one wow. copy, one faithful guy on a bicycle riding up to a guy while he's plowing. So this, coming back to your original introduction, this is what motivated us to ride our bikes and to share. So... We're going to get to your mother's story, but I, mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question. You work in the ministerial area now, um, and this is, it's not necessarily your personal life story, but I think it's an intriguing thing. The Great Controversy was the book that really helped him pivot to be mm -hmm. able to truly understand. There's a lot of people who think that it's not as relevant now. It's dated. It was written back in the 1880s. Um, it's in old language. The stories are old. Why is it still relevant today? Because you handed out great controversies while you were yep. on your bicycle. Why is it still relevant today? Okay. In my mind, I think it's answering questions that people are asking today. And I think it's very current and more current than we realize. There's a lot of literature around saying people love and respect Jesus, but they've given up on the church. They've given up on 
the institution of the, the broader universal church. They're dismayed with it. The great thing about the great controversy is it explains what's happened so that people have given up on the church and it provides an answer to it. Hmm. There so it's is... actually perfect for a post-Christian exactly. mind. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I like to share them with a conversation, you know, telling people a little about it, preparing them for it. Um, and I think it's I think it's more current and more relevant than we actually realize. You make me want to go read it again. Um, and I, you, and I you don't have to read it. You can actually listen, listen to, to no, it. I, you know, I, oh, maybe. Maybe it would be one of those books. There are certain books I just cannot listen to, and there's some books I can listen to. It's a personal thing. It's like autobiographies I can listen to, but like thought and leadership books, I can't. I think it's because I want to underline things. Yeah. But that's because I'm a book, book person. So. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it traces the incredible faithfulness of people <laughs> in the most adverse circumstances, and it really fortifies faith. My favorite, my favorite chapter actually is the, the stories of Huss and Jerome mm -hmm. because you watch someone who 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 kind of gives up and then someone who stands firm and then you see how that transforms someone else mm -hmm. and I remember reading that chapter when I was probably 16 17 and it left an um a huge impression on me on like even if I do make the wrong choice I can still come back and make the right one. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, there is redemption for you. You Like, if you've fallen, you you don't have to fall forever. And, um, but you can also just be faithful. And I think that it, there's just like a, a promise in that to me, like a hope that it's okay, Alyssa. Just keep doing your best. Be faithful to God. And even if you fall, he's always there. Exactly. But let's get back to your mother's side of okay. the family. Sorry. <laughs> we keep tangenting. <laughs> well... Again, there's the great controversy in this story too. Really? Yeah. My grandfather, his grandfather came from Scotland. Okay. Okay. And they were pretty staunch Scots. And my grandfather, World War One started. He was a Presbyterian and he enlisted in the AIF, the Australian Infantry. And he went off and, and did front line in the trenches in France and Belgium. And mm. he, he went through ghastly stuff. His best friend, I don't want to go into too many details, but his best friend standing right beside him was killed right there and then. One of the most dangerous things in the whole war was the, the task of crawling forward at the front trenches mm -hmm marking on a map where the enemy was, who they were and their approximate numbers, and then crawling back. And that was the task assigned to my grandfather. Oh, wow. And he lived. He was caught in no man's land alone for two weeks. You know, he went through incredible stuff. He, he had an artillery shell land between his feet in the mud and it didn't explode. He was wounded. I'll never forget, he, as an old man, he, he had shrapnel above his eye. And the older he got, the more it used to hang down, oh. this piece of shrapnel. He'd been shot, but he survived. His best friend didn't, and he came home. And he was, he was a strong, resolute man, you know. He, he wasn't a feeble kind of guy. But every night, every night... There was an horrendous nightmare. And it wasn't just a wrestling in the bed. It was a s screaming out nightmares. Mm. He was married. He had two daughters. But they'd lost four sons. And they lived in the middle of nowhere once again. <laughs> This, Is most of Australia the middle of nowhere? There's a lot of <laughs> empty space in Australia. But they lived on a farm, and it was at the end of the road, at the end of the valley, the last house. And you had to cross the, a creek twice, and there was no bridge. And in 1926, 
My grandfather's there with his wife, two daughters. He's out working on the farm. His name's Reg. His wife's name is Jean. And she's at home with the two children. And in August that year, a guy on a horse rides up to their farm. He also, there's a bit of Scotland in all of this. <laughs> His name was um, John Craig Sterling. He had graduated from Avondale as a theology student. And before you were accepted into ministry, in those days, you did a year of literature evangelism. He rode up to their farm. Jean wasn't particularly interested in the book, but she felt sorry for him. <laughs> and I wonder if she thought that there's something in here that might get us through the night without the grief of losing four sons, without a screaming nightmare. Is there something in this? So she bought the copy of The Great Controversy. And incidentally, in that whole year, he sold one copy of Great Controversy in August 1926, and he sold it to my grandmother. Oh, wow. She bought it, left it on the kitchen table, and my grandfather, his name's Reg McLennan, he came home from work, working on the farm, picked up the book and said, what's this? And Grandma said, this nice Mr. Sterling came by in a horse. I felt sorry for him, so I bought this book. Mm. He started reading it, threw his pipe in the fire, studied his Bible really carefully and examined it. Yeah, this is true. And he became an Adventist. And that little girl was two years old. She was my mother. Oh, 1926. Wow. And so this this idea of people meeting people and sharing this book, it's kind of in my blood, if that makes it, sense. It does. <laughs> it, it, it does make sense to me. Um, so your father and your mother meet and they have Anthony. Where were you born, Anthony? Were you in the middle of nowhere as well? Uh, in a small city <laughs> in New South Wales, not too far from where my um, mother's family was in Lismore and um, yeah born in a small city not much has changed there in the intervening years but it was it's a beautiful area and a great area to grow up I had two really good parents four very good grandparents and two terrific brothers and a wonderful sister Sounds like a, a wonderful family life. To, now, you grew up Adventist then, obviously. Yes. Um, I mean, although we are born into Adventism, at some point we'll probably hear where it becomes real to you. Mm -hmm. But so you're going to, a, I'm guessing there is a local Adventist congregation in your area? Yep. Do you go to Adventist schooling? Is that a thing in that area? It is. But my parents had a different philosophy. They decided to send me to a state school. Okay. Their philosophy was the sooner you learn to stand up on your own two feet and take what's going to come your way, the better. Learn it in school. And so every morning we had family worship, you know, prayer. When I was very young, I can remember each evening my parents would go through the Sabbath school quarterly with me. Do you know, it was Adventism, Christianity, Jesus, what Jesus did for humanity and his second coming was a big, big thing in our family, really big. Now, sometimes people who've read The Great Conference, they can think, oh, it kind of makes you feel scared about life. When you were growing up, because the way you're talking about it is this very much, it's very gospel sound, this Jesus sound, which actually is really the heart of Adventism. Um, do you feel like that was kind of more your upbringing, though? Was this just Christ-centeredness, or was there... Because sometimes, you know, we, we, we learn and we grow, and... I did have a prayer that Jesus, when he would return, that he would come back at ten past night, ten past nine at night, because bedtime was nine o'clock. <laughs> I would have just said my prayers, and I'd have a chance. I'm a sinner. I'm an Adventist, but I'm a sinner. 
And um, I thought, you know, my parents taught me to kneel beside my bed and to pray and to confess my sins every night. And I thought, if Jesus could only come. Right after. Exactly. Before. <laughs> I'll make it. But I went to Avondale. Uh, I went to university for a year. That was a Jonah year. We're moving very quickly here. Yeah, yeah. How, now, real quickly, I just going back here for a few seconds mm -hmm. here. What about your high school years? Did you... Sometimes our teen years can be a little more fun. Um, and for some of us, like me, um, this is actually when I had my conversion experience, was in my teenage years. What were your teen years like? Very, very fond memories of those. It was a, I grew up with a wonderful church, a very supportive church. The elders, the deacons, the deaconesses, the pastors, they were, they were good. They really cared for me. They loved oh. me. So, lady in the church, you know, my parents, they worked hard. They were very faithful, but we didn't grow up in an extravagant family. I had a teddy bear. It was given to me by Myrtle Shelford. When my mum died, she had four boxes of treasures that she had all lined up for her four kids. Sitting on the top of mine was my, the teddy bear that I'd had from being very, very young. I'll never forget the Sabbath, Myrtle Shelford gave me my teddy bear I'm not a Mr Bean you know how he has his teddy bear <laughs> but it's that was my teddy bear it was given to me there were I, I look back at the elders they were the pathfinder leaders and directors they really invested in the kids you know men like Neville Leeson Lloyd Chilcott do, do you know they they really had a ministry for youth had us to their homes went out, took us camping, did, did stuff with us. They really demonstrated the love of Jesus. And yeah, that was really significant. Another elder, he was often preaching in other smaller country churches. He would never keep the pulpit for himself. He would get the youth, load up his car. We'd all have, you know, five or seven minutes each. We'd prepare the sermon with him. And he'd take us out and, wow, I was preaching at 14 and it was, I was conducting evangelistic meetings, public evangelistic meetings when I was in high school. I was giving Bible studies to friends. That's how involved I was in a state school with sharing. What I love about this was that as a young person, you felt empowered in your church. You felt that you were a part of the church. You were you were peers with those individuals. They didn't make you feel like there was some separation. They mentored you and walked alongside you and encouraged you to do the very same things that they themselves were doing. Yeah. Let me hasten to add, too. I wasn't a perfect kid. You, you know, I made mistakes. Really? Yeah. But, okay. yeah. <laughs> and uh, in spite of that, they still loved and encouraged me. I think that's such a great testimony to our time. I, you know, we talk a lot about young people. They're leaving the church as our older people too. But we talk a lot about young people leaving the church. I don't think most young people want to leave the church, mm -hmm. Anthony. I, I really don't. But are we giving them a reason to stay? And what I'm hearing from you is that they gave you a reason to stay. You were not perfect. You had your, your challenges, but you felt incredibly loved. Yeah. And you felt supported, and you knew that they stood beside you, whether you were the good kid or sometimes mm. maybe a little bit yeah. not as good. <laughs> and I, I felt a really strong pull to sport. And in Australia at that time, all sport was on Saturday, Sabbath. And that was, that was really tough, hmm. you, you know, to choose between playing with school friends and sport, which I really enjoyed, and going to church. That was a tough call. Was there a certain sport you liked? Oh, 
pick a sport I didn't. Okay. Curling. I don't know, that wasn't big. <laughs> but, you know, traditional Aussie sports like cricket, football, rugby, swimming, surfing. You like them all. All of them. Yeah. So, so you get through your high school years. You've had a really, a really great experience. Um, you've gone to state schools, but you have also been taught why you believe, what you believe. You've made it personal to yourself. Um, you've been very active and involved in your local church, and you go off now to university. Now, you, it sounds like you didn't start at Avondale, but you may end at Avondale. Where did you mm. start off? Well, it, to go back again, okay. sorry. It's so okay. this is a you complicated what, interview. You know what? It's not. This is exactly, it's you and me talking, and this is how we would talk in real life, right? Stuff comes out as we think about it. From my earliest recollection, I knew that I should be a pastor. That's just, I sensed that was my, what I was called to do, um, to prepare people for Jesus' return. That was everything. And so when I didn't go to Avondale, to do theology and prepare for ministry, people were saying, what's what's going on? What are you doing? We know that you should be going to Avondale. Um, my parents had a little bit to say about it. Um, I can remember my, my grandfather was a pastor and my grandmother, his wife, she wrote me a letter which was could have been written by Another lady that we know well. Sister White. <laughs> yes. And it was a good letter and a letter that I needed. And it's it wasn't as though I was doing anything bad. I was still, every day I'd had my devotional. Every day at university I'd be still having my Sabbath school lesson. I'd go to church every Sabbath. You know, I wasn't drinking or smoking, doing drugs, any of that stuff. Um but I felt incredibly guilty. It was the worst year of my life. What made you not go to Avondale? <laughs> because if this is where you believe you're being called, and I'm going to call this your Jonah time, where mm -hmm. it's going to become very miserable until you accept the call that God has given you. What made you go to the Jonah years before you finally do what you, what you know? You've got me squirming <laughs> now. I had a girlfriend that wasn't a Christian. And that had an influence on me. But I knew deep down in my heart that I needed to be a pastor. And then I can remember one night when I was at university, as I, I knelt down and prayed before I got into bed, and I prayed, God, if you want me to be a pastor, tell me tonight, or just leave me alone. Don't put this guilt on me. Make it clear that you definitely want me as a pastor. And I went to sleep. And that night, Jesus literally appeared to me. And I know without doubt that he called me to ministry. So I didn't want to waste that year. I wanted to get academic credit for the the subjects that I studied. So I finished that year and um, yeah, that was the end of the girlfriend relationship. <laughs> sure. And I went to Avondale and that was a tremendous time. That was really good. So Avondale um, University now, um, was it Avondale University then? No, no right? Avondale College. Avondale College is in is one of our, it's our premier Adventist school in Australia. Um, it has a seminary there. Um, actually just recently met the current seminary president. She's a brilliant woman. Um, what was your favorite class that you took? Do you remember? I, I really enjoyed them all. There were some I didn't enjoy as much. I'm not going to ask you. We, we, we try to say all the good things, and we all know that there's classes yeah, we don't like. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I like them all. Life and teachings of Jesus. Do you remember who your teacher was? 
Yeah. Yeah. I still remember their lectures. I, I can also remember Old Testament and Lawrence Turner was the teacher for that. And he he brought, he's English, I don't know if you know him, but wonderful teacher, and he brought the New Testament to life. It was wonderful. The, the Old Testament, yeah. So I'm, I'm working on my master's in pastoral ministry, which we I we just had worship for your department, and I know you've mm -hmm. heard that. But there is something about teachers um, who who go beyond the theology and to the heart of theology, because as when you're in pastoral ministry, that's what you have to do. You know, we need to make religion practical. We need to make it transformational. That's what the gospel does. And I can know how to, you know, take a Greek word and Hebrew word and make whatever. But unless it matters to somebody, it's just an exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's good for us because we understand things. But um, I can tell these teachers, those are the kind of teachers. They're the kind that they reached your heart, which then helps you be able to share that with others. Mm -hmm. So um, while you are at Avondale, do you ever meet anybody new? In Avondale? That's a loaded question, isn't it? I met a lot of people. In you did. You were like, yeah, there was my dean and there was some co <laughs> students. And I mentioned teachers. Were there any lovelier faces than other faces? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Deborah, wow. I, yeah, I looked at her and I thought, this is a goddess. <laughs> and I thought, she would never be interested in me. And I can remember they, they thought it was a... She went to do nursing and they, the administration thought it'd be a good idea. We, we had to do a science subject as part of the curriculum. They thought it'd be a good idea if, you know, the ministerial students shared a class with the... With the nursing students? Yeah. I, I understand the storyline that's happening here. And it was biology. <laughs> and, so, and so we were in a, a class for a whole semester and I, I was literally lost for words. I would stand by her and I just couldn't, the words just, I was so nervous. I was so in awe of her. She was, she still is beautiful. She is. Actually, yeah. you guys look like a perfect couple. Like you match each other. You. Well, I've married up, let me assure you. I've married up. <laughs> well, then and, she makes you look really good. <laughs> and, and then I thought, Wow, imagine going through life with this big regret. And she had, as I found out, she had noticed me. She thought I was, you know, might be pretty good for her sister. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so I, I called her and I asked her out on a date with a group. It was a miracle. She said, yes. <laughs> so we went out in a Did group. Did she invite her sister? Not to that one, I don't okay. think. Um, but yeah, and we had a really nice time. And yeah, it's been a wonderful journey since. How many years have you been married? 35. And you still glow like you are oh. a student in a biology <laughs> classroom seeing her for the first time. It is like relationship goals, not because it's probably been perfect or easy at times. But the way your face lights up when you talk about Deborah is, it's beautiful. She's, she's a wonderful woman. She's a wonderful person. She's been just the ideal mother to our kids. Um, so supportive as a pastor's wife. She's strong. Um, she's just got a heart of gold. She's generous. You know... I can invite people home at the drop of a hat, and she says, "No problem, yes." Did, did you know? I'll like, come over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tell us when. Did you know? <laughs> well, you know, she's nothing's too much trouble. It's yeah, she's the life companion of my dreams. So the first time I, I know this is your story, mm -hmm. but the first time I met your wife, um, when 
families transition to the general conference, they have what they call transition ministries. And um, the Elder Wilson's wife, Nancy, will often host different gatherings um, for all the spouses of people who've come in. So when I came, I was at that time, it's different now, but when I came in with that group, I was the only female who I was the person who had been hired. So it was like all these other people and they were all telling their stories. I'm like, I feel like my husband should be here, not me. <laughs> um, but I met your wife then and all of those adjectives that you just said to describe her, I could sense in that first meeting. She just was so kind and so compassionate. Um, it was a big transition for our family. And she just, she was somebody you could immediately tell that you could trust, that she would be there for you if you ever needed it. It's a, it is beautiful. And, and in a pastoral family, that is a, that's a beautiful thing to have. Um, mm -hmm. The spouse that's just there and they're, they're helping you, walking right alongside you in your ministry. So you graduate. Mm -hmm. Are you husband and wife before graduation or do you at least wait until after graduation? I, I didn't feel comfortable proposing until I'd graduated, been offered a job. And then I thought, yeah, now's the time. Um, so it was, I started in ministry in the January and we were married in the August after I'd started in okay. ministry. Yeah. And now where did you start your ministry at? A place called Geelong in Victoria. I know where that is. You know Geelong. I do. One of my friends has lived there for like the You're last year. She me. just moved. But yes, I mean, I know very few cities in, in Australia, but I do know Geelong. Yeah. A little way out of Melbourne. And It's uh, pretty there. Yeah, it is. Famous beaches nearby. Um, yeah, and it was, they they were such a good church to me as well. We we had more than one church. We had um, Geelong, Geelong Hungarian, which was a smaller church. And you're a proficient Hungarian speaker? Uh, no. <laughs> and uh, Hungarian's quite a language to master, <laughs> like, anyway. And we had a, a small rural church in Colac. And um, so it was, a, it was a really good introduction to ministry. I had a great boss. Pastor Lynn Utley, yeah, he was a terrific, terrific intern trainer and coach. He was ruthless and tough. And I'd get, we, every morning we'd have our, uh, every Monday morning we'd have our, you know, meeting together. He, he was tough and exacting. And that was good for me. And I'd walk into that meeting praying earnestly because, <laughs> yeah, he had high expectations and I had to meet those expectations. And that was good. What would you say were some of your greatest challenges in those early years of pastoral ministry? Uh, probably meeting my own expectations, getting the things done that I wanted to get done. It, it wasn't as though I was, you know, running off entertaining myself, doing... Going to the beach? Yeah, no, nothing like... I gave up surfing. Oh. Yeah. I had one surf and that was it. Literally left it. And, and I used to love surfing. And they're the, the best waves in the country, uh, 20 minutes from where we were living. And, yeah, surrendered that. Not, not that it needed but to be, but I was just... For you, that was what you needed to do. Well, I was just dedicated to ministry. All of a sudden, I found more pleasure giving and sharing Bible studies than surfing. And I wanted to do that more than surf. It was, it's the greatest pleasure is to, to sit down with the Bible and share the message with people. It's fantastic. So what kind of expectations do you place on yourself that you struggled with? Well, I wanted all Geelong to, to know Jesus and, yeah, and become an not just to know, yeah, but to be a disciples of Jesus and Colac and you know it was just yeah that was 
this planet's got to be ready for Jesus to come. Let's start with Geelong. So how do you transition your mindset to realizing that, okay, I'm not going to reach all of Geelong. They're not, all Geelong is not going to become the next pick Karen Island, you know, yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it takes time, do you know, and maturity. And that's a, a good thing and a healing thing. Um, you, you can you can burn out very flame out very very quickly you can rust out too make no mistake mm. did you know so the it's finding that balance in ministry so for a pastor who's maybe getting ready to graduate from the seminary or whatever and getting ready to go to their church what words of advice would you have because you're right. Ministry people, like there's like a three year kind of thing. If you can get past a hump or something, you know, you can kind of keep going. What do you get? What kind of advice do you give to them? There's a ton I could say. No. But Based on your early years, what would be the greatest piece of advice you would give? Treasure your calling. Remember who's called you to ministry and preserve that. The Apostle Paul in Acts never grew tired of, sh of sharing his experience with Jesus and how he was called to ministry. The Damascus Road experience for Paul, pivotal in his life. Treasure your call to ministry and treasure your relationship with Jesus. That's, that's a cliche thing, but it's, it's easier said than done. I don't, I don't think it's actually that cliche because the first class that they had me take for my master's was actually on um, formation of Christian faith or something like that. But it's all about having our own personal devotional time. It's about prayer and consistent Bible say. Sometimes, and I see this, we're so busy doing the right things, doing the good things, that somehow we forget about that connection. Somehow me working at the general conference and in our minds, it can become like, oh, this is my connection, but it's not. It's an outpouring of that connection. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that's cliche advice. Mm. It sounds cliche, but actually it's, it's, it's at the core oh, yeah. of what I think are probably many ministers' problems. And, and especially for dedicated ones, if I can put it that way. Not that I'd want to, you know... Mm -hmm wheat and tares and sheep and goats and that type of thing. But I, I think of my own experience. Every night I was out. I was either doing something with the youth um, or giving Bible studies or running an evangelistic series every seven nights a week, literally. And I, I had so many Bible studies going that I had... 6 a.m. appointments for wow. Bible studies. Like every night was full. That was the only time available. And like when, when you... And someone opted for 6 a.m.? Yeah. Yeah. Person coming to, to the Lord without a, a Christian background, you clear your diary. You do what you can. You don't want to sacrifice other people that are on the same journey, but you do what you can to help that person find Jesus. And that's what I was doing. But it, it comes at a price when you're out every night. And, and what I mean, you, you're, not, you're not getting home at 8 or 8.30. Sometimes you're getting home at 11 or later. And sometimes, you know, you come home and adrenaline is still surging. And it's, it's hard to relax. And so it's often later than that before you can get to sleep. And then if you've got a 6 a.m. Bible study, you're not getting out of bed at 6 a.m. You, you know, you you want to look half decent. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're getting up and it's not a sin to sleep, <laughs> you, you know. And, you know, work hard, play hard, rest hard, as the old adage goes. So, you know, we, we do need our sleep. The... We, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as we talked about it, we you can flame out very quickly. 
And that was a lesson that I had to learn. Hmm. So after Geelong, 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 Geelong. Yeah. yeah, I, I was like, nope, I said it wrong. After Geelong, um, how long were you there? Two years. For two years. And then where do you go from there? Went to two smaller rural churches. Okay. Also in rural Victoria, uh, Lee and Gatha and Bales. Okay. Now, if someone were to look at Australia, mm -hmm. Victoria is where? Bottom right. The bottom right. So it's like yeah. that kind of like corner area. Yep. Um, I kind of knew, but I figured there's going to be somebody here who does not have Australia, Australian geography, you know, as their core memory. Um, okay. So you end up at those two very rural churches, which are probably going to have very different needs than the ones that, well, maybe not your other rural church, yeah. but so you're starting to have to learn how to adapt and how ministry looks different in different locations and different congregations. How long are you at those two churches? Um, another two years. And they were really good churches. Um, one church was in green rolling hills, lots of farmers, dairy farmers, learn how to milk cows so when I'd, I'd go visiting and work along with the farmers milking their cows sharing with them that's how I did pastoral visitation and um, you know you meet the family you meet their neighbors and friends get into Bible studies with them that way the other church was Bales it was on the edge of Melbourne it's almost consumed by Melbourne now it's grown in the years it was a smaller church, 19 members, and it had been 19 years since they had a baptism when I arrived. Oh, wow. And that was a, it was a nice church. It was a friendly, warm church, but it was just in an environment that was, that was tough to grow. Yeah. So how do you, so what do you do in tough to grow situations like that as a pastor? For me, you pray your heart out. You spend time in the Word, and you visit. Visit the church members. Get to know them. Meet them in social occasions, spiritual occasions. Have them to your home. You visit their home. Get to know their friends. Build bridges with their friends. And see where the Lord takes you. At the end of two years, had the church grown? Yeah. Not doubled in size so you did have at least one baptism <laughs> we had three that's a that's a blessing though yeah. and you know every those are three people who might not have had the chance had you mm. not ended up at that church yeah and fond memories and yeah i lee and gather the other church it's a lovely church we had some baptisms there they were those churches were good and i'll, I'll never forget Excuse me. We left those. It's it's crazy. Every church you go to, you come to in tears and you leave it in tears. You come to it in tears because you've the church you've just left and you leave that new church in tears when you go. That's been our experience all through ministry. So you've always had very positive, it sounds like, experiences at all of your churches. Yes. Difficult. But still positive some some of the churches don't want to mention too many names it's okay we don't have to mention some of their names right <laughs> but uh, tough I, I can remember standing up and preaching and the first sabbath i was there and they said um i did the benediction after my first sermon and the church said well take a seat pastor we're not going to leave just yet we've got some questions for you we want to ask you what you believe about these topics and in front of the whole church, I was asked where I stood on these issues, where my beliefs were. And, you know, this was first date kind of thing. I hadn't <laughs> met these people before and that was challenging. But we, we got over that. And we grew past it. And I love those people. We had our differences. We saw things in different ways. But I can genuinely say they were good people in their hearts. They gave me a bit of a difficult time, but, you know, 
it was a growing experience for me. And let's, to, to be fair, you know, I wanted to be trusted by them as well. And if that's what it took, okay, I'll carry that cross. I think a lot of times churches come out of hard situations themselves, which is why they grill a pastor. They want to understand, like, can we trust him? Like you're saying, it's. I have been in churches where some pastors have not left a legacy that was helpful to the church. Mm. And um, it made it harder for the next pastor coming in yeah. because, you know, are they going to give up on their faith? Are they going to cause our family to leave the church like our former one? You know, it's like there's a lot of there's a lot of trust we place in our pastors. Um, I think as a mother, I, you know, I I'm I want you to have like good biblical theology because my children are hearing what you're saying, you know, and mm. obviously it doesn't make up for what parents should be doing. But they're your pastor. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want to give you the idea that I didn't make mistakes. Did you know, like I look back at some things and I was just at a camp meeting in that conference where I started my ministry and it was a nice experience to be able to apologize to some people for the mistakes that I made. Praise God, they'd forgotten all about it and didn't even remember but some of the stuff that, just, <laughs> that I'd been churning on for years. So um, that was, that was a nice thing. We all, we all make mistakes. Um, the beautiful thing is that you had the humility to recognize your mistakes and even to apologize years later, as need be. So after Bales, was it? And Lee and Gather. And, yes. Where do we go from here? Went to the edge of the outback, a place called Mildura, and had uh, four churches in a district. And it's, it's dry, barren desert if it wasn't for the mighty Murray River, which is Australia's biggest river with the Darling. And um, it only survives by irrigation. Wow. So, um, yeah, four churches there, a, a large school, a, yeah, from K right through. And, um, yeah, I was ordained just before I went there and okay. went there um, as the senior pastor with an intern. And that was my fifth year in ministry. So that was... Something I wasn't expecting. Four churches in the outback. I, you definitely have like a whole, you know, different kind of church. Every single place they move you seems like it's a whole nother kind of thing oh, that yeah. you get to learn. And the interesting thing is, because I know where you're serving now, how helpful all of these experiences are. You understand what it's like to be in a multi-church district. You understand more of an urban setting versus a rural setting. You understand what it's like to be in the middle of nowhere, um, which helps you as you lead um, or come alongside as an association, um, other ministers to to let them know you we're there. We, we've been here. We've I, I've experienced these things alongside you. Mm. Um, and it was quite isolated there. We were, myself and it was Paul in my first year there, we were hundreds of kilometers from another pastor. Wow. And so we were really quite isolated. And this is, this is back in predates email and that kind of stuff. I think faxes were invented or came into use when we were there. But, and this was the era of long distance phone calls. And to call the conference office, that was an expensive enterprise. And the phone allowance, it didn't go too far at all. Like you could blow that on one call. They, they really want you to only call in case of emergency. <laughs> well, it's like your one phone call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, we used to write letters. It's, I'm sounding like a dinosaur, aren't I? I'm not that you know, old. Actually, but the funny thing is, like, I remember writing letters when when I was in like high school and stuff, and I, I don't consider myself that old, but it sounds really old when you're saying it because of all the modern stuff now, but I realize it's really actually not that long ago. It's, it's just, we've had such a rapid increase in technology so quickly that it's like something that happened 20, 30 years ago yeah. feels like a yeah. hundred years ago, like a whole other century. 
Which it was. <laughs> millennium. <laughs> That's true. It's a whole other millennium. <laughs> and, you, you know, I got my first computer there. And and I went for um, the, the dot one. But it, it was a shocker, you know. So I got a, a laser printer. And that cost an absolute fortune. You were an innovator. Oh, well, I, I wanted the best, you know. Like, not for me. This this is for the people, do you know? This is for the Lord, and that's that's what it was all about. Well, he should never have less than our best. Yeah, so exactly. I, I sometimes think that we you know think oh well we should save money and do stuff. But actually, this is God. I'm yeah. not going to save money. I mean, I'm not going to spend it badly. Yeah. But we should be giving Him our absolute best. Everything we design, everything that we publish, everything should be the absolute best because it's to His honor and glory. It is not about us. Yeah. So. You serve for how long? I'm well, waiting for you to say two years because that seems to be your current trend. No, three years. <laughs> okay. We yeah. add a year. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So three years there. And that they were good years. The Mildura Church, it's a sizable church. It was like the second or third biggest church in the conference. And it was um the second biggest Protestant church in town in terms mm -hmm. of attendance. And this is a town of about uh, 50,000 people. So it was, it, I felt the responsibility of that. And I was also running evangelistic meetings. Um, and these were long-term ones. What's a long-term evangelistic meeting? 27 weeks. I have never heard of a 27-week evangelist. Oh, series. you haven't lived. These are the best. I think I have. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 That's a long evangelistic series. Yeah. Sabbath afternoons, okay. th three sessions for 27 weeks. Wait, wait, three sessions. Like how long is each session? Uh, about an hour and a quarter. So for four and a half hours. They were back to back. From memory, you know, three o'clock, five o'clock, seven o'clock. And um, identical for the three. Oh, okay. So somebody would come to one. You don't yeah. come to, okay. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's oh, a no, really no, long. No, 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 that's. <laughs> okay. So basically I can come to one of the slots. Yep. And for 27 weeks, you just kind of keep coming back like one time every yep. week and yep. whatever slot works for your schedule. And That's right. And then midweek we ran seminars on top of the, you know, prophecy seminars or re revelation seminars the idea being is that we 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 wanted to disciple people um and visit with people get to know them so that it wasn't this intense microwaving and let people go on a journey and experience it but it's a tough gig it's not for the fun of heart. It's fascinating to but me. But it's it's a terrific journey. You've, you you can't be f you, whatever happens. You you can't break those appointments. You've got to be there. This is your commitment that you sign up. So you can't get a better offer. So we're about ready as a department. We're actually starting a fourteen week. I think it's fourteen weeks. Um, small group with our department and with some other people. And it's an hour and a half every single week where we're gathering to disciple and study the word together. Um, and you're right. There is something about this long-term commitment. Like we have an evangelistic series that lasts a week, but there is something about this ongoing commitment that I, I've never heard of it, but actually I'm very intrigued by this concept now. And I kind of really love it. It's it's hard. And your contact with the people determines the content that you present. So it's not a set? It needs to be fluid to a certain extent. You, you have an overall plan and you go in with a plan. This is, this is where we want to go. But we don't need to speed through a topic if people are having questions about it. Yeah, if you... When you're visiting, you, you you don't want to present testing truths, as we call them, until 
you're in a close relationship where you're visiting with people and opening the Bible together so that you, you're discipling them through this. It's, it's not just, you know, here it is, ready or not, wanted or not, bang. So it's, it's the way, it's actually the, the way things were done in Australia. At, a long time ago, they would typically run nine-month evangelistic series. Wow. And it was an innovation to abbreviate it down. Um, but evangelists and pastors would be working those, those districts, discipling people, and they, they wouldn't leave for nine months. This was their commitment. Wow. I love it. I am... Um... We're going to talk about this later okay. outside this, but maybe when I come over apparently to your house, because you're just going to let Deborah yeah. know I'm popping in, right? Um, we can we can finish this because it's actually very intriguing to me. Um, so you serve there. Where do you go from here? Into the city. Okay. To, to so Melbourne. Because again, we need, we need a new type of an atmosphere for Anthony to be able to, to gain experience in that he doesn't understand why yet, but the journey yeah. looks, this makes was, sense later on in life. This was in a city church called North Fitzroy okay, and another one called Preston. North Fitzroy is one of the oldest Seventh-day Adventist churches in the country. Ellen White preached from that pulpit. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, another great time. And how long were you there? One year. Okay. One year is a very short stint as a pastor. Yeah, where yeah. did, where well, were you? At, through that year, I was invited to be to join the union. It was the uh, in those days it was the Trans Australian Union, and to to specialise in church planting and evangelism. Okay, so you're going to go to the union level, or you're going to be hired by the union to church plant. Yeah, I was. The salary came from the union. But a, a conference would have me for two years. So I stayed in the same conference. But this, this is something that was really quite significant as well. When I was in Geelong, it's on the western side of Melbourne, we would drive past this satellite city called Werribee, 80,000 people and no Adventist church. Mm. 80,000 people. And I thought to myself, why doesn't somebody go there and do something? There's 80,000 people. Why, why can't people see this enormous population? What's, what's wrong? Well, it was a difficult place. And there was an unpleasantness to Werribee. It, it had the, well, it has, I'm not sure if it still does, but it had the largest sewerage treatment works in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. You know, people would call it, you know, the perfume place and all kinds of things. I was going to say, how did yeah. that smell? <laughs> there were days, depending on which way the wind blew. <laughs> but it wasn't, even when it was, it wasn't that bad. I grew up it in really a city wasn't. that had a chocolate factory. And the way the wind blew, we knew the rain was coming because it smelled like chocolate through the town. I think I prefer chocolate to sewage. <laughs> but it, it really wasn't. It was okay. Mm -hmm. And so as Union Evangelist, I was asked to go to Werribee to plant a church. You were the answer to your own question. And it was fantastic. And I really needed that resilience there because that was tough. We had, um, we met with, there was other churches in the area and we met with them and we asked who'd like to come and leave their church and come to Werribee and do something there. And there were 13 people that said that they'd come. I love those people. They were just gorgeous people. You know, they would, some of them didn't speak English. 
but they loved the people and loved them into the church. You know, we we did training and I'm sorry for getting emotional. No, I love it because I can tell that that the Holy Spirit worked in a very mighty way in that area. And, um, you know, we, we did six months of training, praying, praying together. Every Sabbath afternoon, we'd, we'd look at what we can do, what we can do to reach this community. We prayed together, we learnt together, we grew together. I made some mistakes, but I was doing the best I could. And um, these lovely people. So we started running public meetings. People came. People studied the Bible with us. And people were baptised. Only through God. Only through the Holy Spirit. There was nothing about me that changed those people's lives. It was Jesus, his word, and the Holy Spirit. You go there today, and there's been... We were only there for two years. But pastors have worked hard in the intervening years. There's a wonderful church there today. Amen. Church planting is a very tough one. I, I worked with a church plant. Let me take one, a drink. <laughs> I worked with a church plant one summer, and it's a it takes a special kind of person because you are you're giving up um, your home church. Um, you're it is it's harder work than at a regular church where you can sometimes kind of like you know fade back into like the pew. Um, it, it's all hands on deck, all the time, and it does take a very much intentionality in caring for your community. I and mean, we should have that in all of our churches, but yeah. you especially see this at the people who are in church plants. And and I'm seeing once again God leading you into another area that is going to be able to help you be able to come alongside your brothers and sisters in ministry um, and shepherd them. So you served two years in War Warby? War Werribee. Werribee. I'm mm -hmm. not familiar with these names. So this is this is, I feel like I'm testing my memories here. Um where do you go from Werribee? Well because I was paid by the union, the next conference was Western Australia. Okay. So that's from one side of the country that's to like, the other. That's like yeah, that's like over there. That's right. That's a <laughs> There's not as much over there. Is there? A couple of thousand miles across. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we were based in Western Australia for three years. Because it was so far and there was the expense of transporting us a across mm -hmm. there, they said, hey, stay there for three years. And you and, planted um, another church? Well, I ran evangelistic meetings. Okay. I assisted with the relocation of a church, which was became a, like a, a church plant in another in another area. I assisted with that. But um, Western Australia, that we really enjoyed that. That was that was another good time. The ministry's always been good. I, yeah, and, uh, I, I, this, uh, this feels like an echoing. Like every time I say, it, you're like, oh, this is really, oh, these people, they were really good. Um, yeah. It's beautiful that that was your experience. And but I, I have a feeling, and I'm going to come to it at the end. I'm going to actually wait to the end to say this because um, our time is wrapping up. And I, you know, it's funny every time I talk to people, they're always like, I don't think I have enough to talk about. And I'm like, I always feel like I'm running out of time at the end. Um, you, you're serving here. Do you move to a conference or a union level at any point here in the future? Because there's got to be something in the intervening, yeah. intervening years between you and and the GC. Yeah, yeah. Where do we go? Okay, so from the from the union, I was asked to go to the division, the South Pacific Division, based in Sydney. Um, and what did you do at um, SPD, is what yeah, we call the South Pacific Division. Right. And South Pacific Division is Australia, New Zealand, and like all those islands, and Papua New Guinea, yeah. right? Okay. Yep, yeah. I was asked to be the ministerial secretary for the okay. division, um, which that was, yeah, that, that I was not expecting that, and I don't think too many people were. But as well as that... 
I was asked to be to start the Institute of Public Evangelism for the division, to train and coach pastors, encourage pastors in public evangelism and evangelism. Hmm. So, yeah, that was a five-year term. How long have you been at the GC? I was first elected in 2005 at the St. Louis session. Okay, so at St. Louis. When you came to St. Louis, was I like to find out when people hear that you're being considered for this. What is your what is your first thought? I mean, like I I did had no expectations whatsoever. I didn't expect it. I I it completely a lightning bolt out of the blue. In yeah, a total shock. So you have served at the GC for 20 not quite. No, no. Sorry. I'm really math. There's a reason why I work in the field I do, and I'm not a mathematician. So how many years is it? Just seven, 17, 17, 18 years. Yes. Okay. I was like, oh, I was going the wrong direction. Um, mm. So 17 years, um, 17, 18 years you've, you've worked here. And have you always served in the same position here at the General Conference? Because right now, one of your main areas you look over is that of the elders mm -hmm. of the church, which is... Having listened to your story, I can actually see why you're so perfectly suited for this role. The way you have loved your members, the way you have you discipled, the, the word you use, disciple over and over and over again. I can tell that the lay people in your church really mattered as partners in ministry. So it makes so much sense that you come shoulder to shoulder with the elders. Mm -hmm and help guide them through um you work with elders digest yes are there other areas besides elders digest that you i mean i'm sure because we all don't just do one thing yeah. but yeah. what other areas do you work with well I, we, we have ministry in motion which is a training program for pastors interns elders deacons deaconesses anyone doing ministry in a local church so um, that's available online, ministryinmotion.tv, so you can access that. We also produce resources, manuals for pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses. Um, we also produce, we have a book club, which produces books for pastors. How did I not know this? Yeah. And you ought to be in the book club for about five or six bucks a year. You get some fantastic books. Talk sign to me, me up. afterwards. I'm like, sign me up. I love books. I love reading. So. Yeah. yeah. So, and another one of my responsibilities is continuing education for pastors. So encouraging them in that. And also in, um, in theological ministerial preparation for ministry as well. So we need to wrap it up here, but... I think the thing that I've taken away the most, I, we've talked some, um, I watched you, you know, ride up in my church. <laughs> the first time I feel like I started to see this side of Anthony, this heart side, because this is what I've realized is that you're an incredibly passionate and compassionate person. I can see it. Um, and I saw this at the elders meeting. I had been recently called to be an elder at our church, and it was a very humbling call. And you got up and you started presenting to us. And as you shared and helped us learn what we needed to do, um, I could see a passion for helping lay members know how to offer pastoral care to others. But this genuine love for helping us, us to be a, a, a community as a church, that the elders role is to help bring that church together. It is not just a pastor's responsibility. And as I'm listening to you talk, and as I'm, as I'm just enjoying hearing what you are saying, I realize that God has carefully brought you here at this place in time for a very specific reason. The world is getting larger and larger, it feels like. And Christianity feels like it's shrinking and shrinking. 
And pastors can only do so much. But really, the members, the elders, it's our privilege to walk alongside our pastors and to proclaim the gospel. Those people who brought books to your relatives, they were not pastors. They were literature evangelists. They were church members who were serving in different capacities. And we have all been called to proclaim the good news. The way you have spoken today, I can see your heart for people, your heart for the mission of this church, that you don't want anyone to be left behind. And um, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the transparency and the um, just this, the passion that you have for, for humanity, really not just your members, but for the community, the fact that you're in there milking a cow. Um, it just, it shows me the kind of person you are. You're the kind of person who wants more than anything to allow Jesus to be seen through you. Well, he's the one that really matters. Did you know? And that's, that's a cliche, but without, without Jesus, we're all doomed. There's, there's nothing. There's only one way to eternal life, and that's through Jesus. There's no, no option B. That's it. And in a sense, yeah, I, I know I'm a pastor, and I'm very aware and conscious of that. But I just see myself as a church member on the payroll. There's, there's, there's no difference no difference between me and another disciple of Jesus, you know. We all bleed, tickle us, we all laugh, Aww. you know, we all eat rice and beans, you, you know. They're like, good. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we are in this together with Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. We hope you enjoyed this episode of ANN Profiles with my special guest, Anthony Kent. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast or YouTube channel wherever you are tuning in today, because we don't want you to miss another future episode. Thank you for spending this time with us and join us next week as I get to continue to know the life stories of more inspiring people.